Good morning. It's uh, Monday at 10 o'clock. Huh. I didn't even wait an extra minute. Hi, Enforcer Home One. Thanks for joining in. So, well, I guess it's not really early on Monday, is it? <laughs> it just feels early to me because I'm old and tired all the time. But um, I'm sure that most people have been up for quite some time. And those of you who might, you know, be in Europe have been up. Well, it's already afternoon, early evening. Um, so here it is Monday and it's time for, uh, it's 10 here. Well, it's, yep, it's 10 here too. We must be in the same time zone, Eastern US, or is it 10 o'clock like PM? <laughs> um, well, today being Monday, it sort of started out with like me bumping into things and knocking things over. I seem to do that just an awful lot lately. I think it comes with, uh, okay. Oh, cool. So you're working on that now? Or is that what you're doing elsewise? Um, so I'm going to be starting slowly today because it's Monday and we've been digging out, especially, well, I haven't been doing that much digging, but, you know, a fair amount of moving around in like foot and a half deep snow, which was, um, yeah. When winter came, it came. Uh, we didn't have any snow. It was like 35, 38 degrees drizzling almost constantly from, oh, middle of November until... Too variable? Okay. Sometimes sometimes you can get a lot of different components into a, into a character. My character on our Dyson Dungeons... Dungeons and Dragons show is pretty simple. I'm a furbog fighter, and um, not too not too dumb a fighter, but I have no charisma, and so um, okay. Well, you can bounce some ideas around here, and actually, if who shows up, who is a really good person to. Um, to bounce ideas around because uh, he he plays uh, all sorts of different characters and different games, but we can try. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not the most creative person in the world, at least right, at least at the moment. On Monday morning, with my eyes feeling all jowsy, yeah. So snow. So we didn't have any snow at all until just this like this last week, and then the entire. Uh, the entire uh, month of December's and January's worth of snow decided to come in this span of like four days. So, yeah, trying to keep the bird feeders filled and uh, there's an outside outlet that got buried and I need to dig that out today uh, to make sure that the breaker hasn't tripped. Anyway, yeah, so after I'm done with relaxing painting, I'll be uh, out in the snow again. It's very pretty, I guess. Um, a little bit damaging. We lost a big chunk of tree. That was kind of unpleasant. Big chunk of tree fell down. Um, broke. Well, at least distorted a big part of a fence. That temporary repairs will be waiting until uh, the snow disappears. And since it's really cold out, you know, winter will probably hang around now until sometime in April. Juniper is a good name. A clone of what? The idea of a clone of herself? Um, mother? Super strength and elemental powers. Well, that would fit together. Let's see, I'm going to be doing some painting today, because this is relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. Um, so the elemental powers, would, be, would that be the 
ability to manipulate all the elements or would it be like specific to just a couple? Like just a single elemental. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do today is not paint the Quetzalcoatl. Okay, this, this is, uh, this is a really, really cool model. It's hyper detailed. Okay, what is with that? I thought I cleaned all of those up last week. So, um... The problem with these rosin prints, though, with feathers there, it's, it's not attached, it looks like it needs to come off. Um, as I was cleaning this up on Friday, somehow or other, it was weird, I was cleaning up somewhere else and one of these feathers broke, but... Oh, okay, well that would be interesting. It would be interesting to let the DM pick the elements, and then, uh, but then you'd have to adapt pretty quickly to whatever the DM picked. Um, yeah, I broke off one of these feathers, and I repaired it, and I think, you know, unless you look through my head magnifiers, uh, you can't tell which one it was, which is good, which means it's fixed. But this is a highly detailed... Um, model with multiple layers of feathers on it and just not in the realm of my skill level this morning but it's supposed to look like this so basically it's kind of a blue bluish black on the back of the body and the tops of the wings and then especially on the wings it kind of fades for, into yellows and reds um, this is one that, that has a lot of shading on it. Here's one that has the same sort of color, has the same sort of color schemes, you know, the dark bluish and purple on the top and the tops of the wings, and then it fades into yellows and reds. So, yeah, I should probably... Oh, okay, well... Yeah, so they... I mean, they they look very different from each other. This is more like the way I paint. This is the way it should be painted. Um, but I get a good sense of the of the general color scheme that it should be painted, and I'm going to try to make it look more like this than this. We'll see how that turns out. It may end up looking more like this, but even that would be okay, I guess. There's just a lot of shading of one color into the next. And that, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I would suggest so that you don't put too much um, burden, I won't call it burden, but you know, if you don't put too much on your DM, is uh, you pick the elements and let the DM uh, adjust the campaign around the ones that you pick. As long as you don't make it like too OP. If it's way too overpowered, then sometimes the DM has a really hard time working with that. But lightning would be really good. And yeah, um, especially effective against in the rain and against metallics and things like that. So so why don't you I mean, being non-traditional, I think, is fine. It makes the DM work a little bit harder. But as long as your character is not too overpowered with it and doesn't just dominate the whole scenario, I think that would be kind of cool. Um, it would be kind of interesting. So you got lightning, and you could either do something that was compatible with lightning, you know, like lightning and fire kind of thing, or you could do something that was like opposites, like lightning and... Uh, maybe water or ice um, but then your character has to be careful too because if you're doing both lightning and ice you could short yourself out so speak if that's if that's a thing that happens in your game <laughs> wow okay 
Um, yeah, then I, I would say get your character together as much as you can and describe it to your DM because your DM is probably stressed too trying to put together a game with a system you haven't played before with players who haven't done it. Um, so other than the Quetzalcoatl, which will be really cool to paint sometime when I am not dropping things, I've got this spiky eight-legged kind of creature, right? And also this robot. And this robot was printed and uh, it it f kind of failed in that the arm didn't print. Cool. Yeah, so I would say you can be non-traditional, but don't keep it too terribly complicated. Like two or three, two or three elements that that might be, com you know, complementary or maybe opposites. Uh, but make sure that your DM knows what you're doing, so that they can plan the scenario ahead of time. Um, so the explanation for the loss of arm here is that this was a battle robot and it's uh, taken battle damage. So I'm actually going to be painting this today because how can I mess this up, right? It's a battle damaged robot. So I'm going to be painting it in a couple different, le different shades of metallic, you know, darker and lighter just to, you know, to bring out some of the detail like the riveting and whatever. And then um, I'm gonna play with the shading. Okay, so I've got a, a smoky ink and a brown so I can do like rusty stuff. I've got dark gray and even blue and green. And I can do like uh, smoke effects. I'm not really that good at that kind of thing, but like I said, it's just, it's just this is sort of a playing around thing. This is almost certainly never going to show up in any of our streams or whatever. So this is just going to be, um, yeah, I got to do some relaxing painting on Monday and I want it to be f relaxing for me. And uh, that means uh, doing something that can't be too terribly oopsed. The Quetzalcoatl could be oopsed in a significant way, and I don't want to do that. It's a really nice, it's a really nice, highly detailed model. And like I said, if it can, if it can end up looking sort of like this, that would be really, that I would be very happy about that. So I'm going to set it aside, meaning in a place where I hope it won't be broken. Because it's got a lot of fragile details on it, like the feather I already broke and repaired. This guy is not very fragile. Even the little spikes aren't very fragile. I probably could break off the fingers and the arm here. I could probably do that pretty easily. Um, you know, and if the robot moves along, I might go on to this. This is uh, what I finished on Friday. Um, it's a Shetland Pony Unicorn, and... The other members of Dyson Dungeons said we want it to be a rainbow unicorn with a midnight sky, starry sky, mane and tail. So uh, there's now in a golden horn, right? So we now have, for reasons unknown to me, a rainbow unicorn. After looking at it, uh, their discussion, I don't know why, but um, apparently we're going to be looking for glitter. Really fine glitter or maybe something pearlescent or just, I don't know. They talked about getting glitter nail polish, but not the, not the acetone kind because that would not only take the paint off, it would dissolve the plastic underneath that stuff is amazingly uh, yeah, nasty. Um, but uh, this may end up being shiny and glittery in addition to being rainbowy, I don't know. But there it is. And I can set that aside now. So in addition to painting a robot, and I'm going to avoid starting on this until, you know, later, because uh, it's just... It's just Monday, you know? Um, but yeah, I've got 
I got, I did some prep work though. This was good. I got uh, a bunch of um, metallics out here, like steel and dull aluminum and even chrome. Pure aluminum. I think there's even a white. White aluminum, yeah. Various shades. These are made for model airplanes, these paints. You know, where the panels on the plane are sometimes different materials. So, even though the basis is aluminum, or aluminium, as they say in Europe, and probably everywhere other than the U.S. or North America, um... Yeah, I've got all sorts of different shades of this. I'll be able to paint, paint it on here and um, do that. And then uh, get the washes out and try to make it look really beat up. And it really, it turns out, fortunately, that it isn't going to really matter how it turns out. Because it's just a battle broken robot. The other thing I need to do is um, this Archer Sprite here. So I, for some reason, uh, took it upstairs to show it to people. And in the process, the arrow point that I had, that I made to replace the one that I had broken off because this was on a stand. It was on one of those sticky tack stands and I knocked it over and it fell face down and the arrow point went flying off into the nether. It's disappeared in some interplanar loss thing where other parts that I've broken off have gone and where socks go in your dryer. Um, I found the bottom of the bow that was kind of miraculous. Really, I was crawling around on the floor for what some felt like a long time, but was probably like two minutes, and I found that, which was good, because making a new one of those would have been pretty difficult. Um, but making an arrowhead turned out to be really easy, but it didn't stay on. So I'm going to actually make another one using toothpicks, because they're easy to work with. And uh, I'm going to then attach it with, I used contact cement earlier and that, that didn't hold. So I'm going to try, I'm going to try epoxy, tiny little dot of epoxy, which sometimes does hold. Uh, CA glue would be really good, but I don't really, I don't have any, or at least I don't have any that's any good because it dried up in the tube. There might be one back there in, oh, there's like drawers and drawers full of nuts and bolts and stuff. You know how those accumulate. Um, yeah, there might, there might be uh, some there, but it's probably not good anymore. Anyway, the, the problem with CA glue and me is that uh, you need to, because it just grabs immediately, is you need to I need to get the, the piece placed like right off the the first you know it just has to go on right because there it's gonna stick and if it isn't then then it's a mess I know that there are some that don't set up like immediately like gels and things that uh, actually give you an gives one an opportunity to move things around a little bit, but I don't have that. So anyway, I'm just going to sand this down so that it is kind of hopefully arrow point shaped, and then I'm going to make it a little thinner because it's the toothpick is too fat, too thick. Um, and then I'm going to cut it off after it's shaped and thin and mix up some epoxy 
just you just stick it on. Five minute epoxy, so it'll be a good good way to waste like five minutes of time waiting waiting for it to set up enough so it doesn't just immediately fall off. So some other non-painting things that I'm going to be doing on relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons today. Trying to see if it's, I guess it doesn't much matter. As long as it's kind of pointy on one end and flat on the other end, that's, that's arrowhead shape. That'll, that'll be that. That's kind of pointy. There it is, it's kind of pointy there, so um, it's a little asymmetric, but that's probably okay for the purposes of this month. Being pointy is the most important, and the toothpick wasn't pointy, but now it is. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to make it thinner by rubbing it this way. Toothpicks, toothpicks work really well for this. I've made many, many sword blades with toothpicks because I have broken many sword blades. And I would say that um, when I've broken a sword play, blade off, I've, I'm trying to remember if I ever found one ever, I think once be like once out of eight or nine times it might be that many times that I've broken off sword blades and I think I found one once I was able to reattach it but for the most part um, no I don't find them and then I have to um, make a sword blade out of a toothpick and you can see how easy that would be right i mean it's already shaped like a sword blade just need to point make it pointy and thinner so this arrowhead is kind of like making a sword blade except it's just it's real small which makes it a little bit challenging like holding on to it becomes a challenge Yep. But, you know, I really don't want that model to not have an arrowhead. It really needs an arrowhead. I'm kind of tempted to paint this before I put it on. Um, the other arrowhead was holding on really pretty well until I painted it. And, and it just went floppy all over the place. Eventually just got bumped by something and and then uh, that broke it. But, I mean, what would it hurt to paint it ahead of time? I used the bronze paint, this stuff. doesn't really matter what brush I use, does it? If it's sort of got bristles, I'm gonna use I'm gonna use a really crummy brush. And then I'm just gonna stick it in there. I'll just stick it in there now and then paint the tip. And then cut the tip off. I let it dry and while it's drying I can mix up the epoxy because like I said it's five minute epoxy but if I let it just sort of set before I use it for four minutes then I only need to hold it for
because, I mean, it might be boring to watch, but it's really even more boring to do, to uh, hold a piece in place, especially a tiny piece like this, for four or five minutes. Just not fun. There's a magnet in the base of these things. And this is a big chunk of iron of some sort. If I got them close together, that was here, this was here, that would pull together, that would knock that down. And no doubt, no doubt break the pieces off again. And who knows if they could be found. There, now, it, now I've got... Um, what will become an arrowhead to be attached to the arrow shaft helps to be on camera attached to the arrow shaft of this thing that I painted earlier. The who isn't done yet? No one's asking for a flip. I've got my flip material already when somebody does ask for one. Really prepared today. That's kind of an unusual thing too. Um, yeah, I was going to mix some epoxy. Need the smallest little drop of it, which is really not easy to do, so. Let's squeeze some out here. This is the, uh, the rosin part of it. I discovered when I attached the feather to the Quetzalcoatl with this drop of epoxy is that making the drops too small makes it really hard to get them the same size and mix them together. And in this case, I don't, I didn't, even though it's holding, the feather is still there. It wasn't enough hardener mixed in with the rosin. And so this is actually still not completely cured, but it's holding together. And what, what more could one want? Okay, mix these end up with like 50 times more epoxy than I need because I need like less less than is on the tip of this toothpick right now. Okay. I need to wait like three minutes for this to start curing so I don't have to hold the toothpick arrowhead in place for forever. I need to, since I got, there's a little bit of hardener on the bottle. It's now on my finger. It's just some isopropyl alcohol. These are all like test things. This, this was a, a test sheet. Different greens to see which would work best together with washes on them or not. Same thing here. I was testing different oranges for the base of the Archer Sprite. It turned out looking really kind of yucky actually. This was a test of the mane and the tail of the uh, rainbow unicorn. So I took the really dark purple, but it wasn't dark enough. So I tried the gray wash on it and it worked. And those are pearlescent painted drops testing. 
so yeah, it's important to have a high-tech uh, test surface, like a piece of index card. This is gone. Get a new paper towel. Look at that. Burning through resources willy-nilly here. <laughs> That's a good phrase, willy-nilly. Does anyone ever say that anymore? Is that a thing? Or is that just showing my age again? I think I need to get my coffee. Drinking my coffee from my official... See that? Dice and Dungeons mug. Let's get our logo on it. These are really cool mugs. And you can knock them over without breaking them sometimes. Like I've done twice. Once down here and once upstairs. It didn't break either time. Um, I can't promise that if you were to somehow get one of these and you knocked it over, that it wouldn't break. And when I mean knocked it over, I mean I just like tipped it over. It's not like I knocked it over onto a cement floor or something like that. I could say with high certainty that if I were to knock this off the workbench onto the concrete floor of the basement here, a lot of cream in my coffee, that um, that it would break. If it fell onto the rubber mat that I've got, rubber mats to stand on, which if one is standing at a workbench is a really nice thing to have. Makes your feet less tired less quickly. Okay. So that's been sitting there for a time. Now it is time to yeah, I very carefully I very carefully put the exacto knife somewhere else so now I need to cut this off and not lose it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll hold on to it. I cut it off. The exacto knife blades, you know, they're supposed to be really sharp. Well they don't stay sharp for an infinity amount of time. And so, there. They don't stay, stay sharp for an infinity amount of time. And so, like this one, it's not sharp. So, in my fingers is um, the thing that's supposed to be an arrowhead. And this is epoxy that's getting pretty sticky. I waited too long. Glasses off, I can't see. Good, I've got an epoxy string all over everything. Okay, so I'm gonna attach this to the tip of the arrow there and hope that it will hold. Not be pointed off to the side like that. Okay, well now it looks now it looks like there is an arrowhead at the end of the arrow, which is a, a good thing. At least at a distance, that's what it looks like. It is. Oh, oh yeah. Let's just bump in, bump into the thing that's broken there. Bump into the thing that's broken there. This this poor thing has uh, had a fair amount of uh, being broken.
almost had it right and then I moved it around again. Can't leave things alone. That's where it should be. All right, so now it looks like it's got an arrowhead and um, also it looks like there's epoxy on the paint. Get the blob, the blob of the epoxy off. all of it off now it's adhering to the tweezers lovely okay good enough so now there's sort of an arrowhead looking thing at the end of the arrow shaft and it looks like it's holding and I'm putting it away because otherwise I'll play around with it yet even more leading to an oops Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start putting paint on this robot thing. Take a look at it. Uh, so it's a battle bot kind of thing. So it's not going to have too terribly many colors on, but I do want to do some contrasting things with some of the plates. Okay, and and maybe some of the like the riveted areas. I'm gonna do those. Those bands, you know, when you do bands like that, they end up being kind of traditionally darker than the rest. I think I'm going to reverse that and make them. Well, no, I want this whole thing to be fairly light in color because I want the rust and the, the, the battle damage and stuff to show. Um, let's just use... Plain old dural aluminium, okay? This is kind of in the middle of the uh, different shades of metallic that I've got. I also have this thing called dull aluminium, which is the same color as the aluminum but it doesn't have a metallic sheen to it it's like it's like a flat paint version of the metallic So this is the base color. I'm going to paint like the legs, the the calves, these gigantic things. These robots always have these gigantic things on their bottoms. I don't know why that is. Paint it here and here and here. Okay, so this will be kind of like the standard color and then or shade at least. And then um, some other bits will be lighter and darker. Mainly, I'm going to be using this and like the white aluminium. I need steel that's really dark. There's another aluminum color here. It's dangerous to reach. Yeah, just plain aluminium. 
I just use plain old aluminium. That's the one I was looking for anyway. These are made for airplanes. They're, the, the paints themselves are designed to be used with an airbrush. So they're really quite thinned already. Okay. Um, a little bit goes a very long way. So be not using too terribly much paint. But eventually this will have metallic paint all over it and um, some bits of it, like maybe the, some parts of the weapon hand um, and so on, might be painted different colors. The inside of the uh, helmet, here, I'm going to paint that black on the inside there. Do that in a little while before I paint the helm. Two drops of that should be actually more than enough to paint the bits that I'm planning to paint with it. Discovered sometimes, you know, painting a surface like this painting over the edges is a good thing because it um, it identifies where the boundaries are and these paints are pretty good at covering over themselves get a model like this and it's got like all these little bands and things on it and it can get real can very easily end up with like eight different colors on it which I am going to attempt not to do on camera I'm going to guess I'm going to guess right now that most of these will just end up looking the same. That the difference in shading of the various different uh, aluminum variations is going to be, you won't be able to tell. So these paints cover really well. They level nicely. They don't show brush marks on small areas like this. On an airplane, you know, you've got a big fuselage or a wing or something, it would, it would need to be airbrushed, unless there was just a lot of texture on it. I'm getting bubbles, weird. Getting bubbles. Probably should have painted underneath there first. We may end up doing some touch-up work a little bit later. Like under, you know, under there. It would have been better to paint that first and then paint up to it because this is a raised surface, but I wasn't paying attention or planning ahead. That was a, that was a failure of... Um, modeling skill there. What you're seeing here is um, not, not planning ahead on the layering because there's areas underneath there that need to be painted. I'm just I'm just going to cheat, okay? I'm just going to paint them this color. And then I don't need to worry about it, right?
have uh, been made metallic color looking. Ta-da. You know, and I paint these um, these gigantic leg things that, that seem to be a standard standard issue for these robotic kinds of creatures. And maybe, yeah, I'm just going to paint down here too. I'm going to paint those bands a different shade. These little rivet bands. Anyway, this is all going pretty quickly, and I may end up finishing this robot early. Meaning before 2 o'clock. In which case, I will work on that eight-legged eight spiky creature. I'll get some advice about what color is that supposed to be. And then uh, painted those colors. I said I was going to do several non painting things during this stream. One of those I did, which was to fabricate and attach a replacement arrowhead to replace the one that was already a replacement because I had broken off the arrowhead before I started painting the archer sprite creature and then um, fabricated an arrowhead and glued it on and then broke it off and lost it so I did already fabricate another one out of a toothpick and it's attached and now it looks like there's an arrowhead on the arrow again at least if you don't get too close to it that's what it looks like here so I've got Got some bolts. again. I've got some metallic paint on pieces of this robotic creature. Okay, and then I think the next bit that I'll do will be the um, the back, the back and the skirt kind of thing, and. Got this paint out. Paint this bit, also this color. There, there's. This is all just going to be shades of this metallic paint. Some darker than others. Some lighter. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, there's two parts to this. I'll have to repaint that other part. I didn't see that at first. Some, Like I was saying, sometimes when, when I paint something, I can see layering and details that aren't really clear when it's just primer. And that was the case here. It's pretty obvious now that there is like a metallic overplate on top of like an under layer of something. Okay, well that's enough of this. Clean this brush off and um, decide what color will be next. I'm going to use a darker color 
and paint some bits of this darker. But first, first, get black. All of the paints, like 90, 85% of all the paint colors are now splattered out, not splattered, but scattered out all over the top of the workbench instead of being neatly put away in these really cool paint holder, custom made paint holder things that Alexis had made. Game color black, there's two blacks. There's game color and model color. One is black I want and the other one isn't. I'll look at my color chart and see which one, which is up there. I want the not this one. The not this one. I'm going to put the not this one um, there and look for the one I do want. This is the one I wanted. Okay. One of them, the model color, is a very nice flat black. Okay. And it levels really nicely. The other one has more gloss to it. And it has that same sort of viscosity that comes with the oranges and the yellows that I complained about when I was doing the unicorn. You know. They're viscous when they go on. They're almost gel-like. And they don't cover very well, and it takes three, sometimes four coats. Anyway, yes, several... I was going to do several non-painting things during the stream today. One of the non-painting things was the fabrication and attachment of the air replacement double replacement, the replacement of the replacement arrowhead. And I managed to do that. Okay, I need a very fine pointed brush to get it into the nook and cranny there. But because I'm going to be poking the paint into that, I'm not going to use a good brush because um, this is going to push the bristles around. Just need that. Need like a dot paint. You know, I'm just getting it in here. Trying to anyway. Trying to get into the, the openings there, so that when the Metallic is painted over it. The uh... oh, that's really deep. I'm going to put my head magnifiers on for a second. I didn't realize how deep that uh, opening was, and I want to make sure I get the paint down in there so that it is black. Infinity deep. Obviously, yeah. Even this, it's like a quarter of an inch long and it's not reaching in. Okay, I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to. So I'll get out um, one of the better brushes that has a very long bristle. Get the paint in there. Hmm? Like the whole inside of the helmet is hot. I mean, it actually might be. It's weird. Yeah, I know it's all messy in the front, but that's, that's okay. 
does this paint will dry and then when I paint the helm it won't look messy anymore at least that's the idea Yeah, I bet if I, you know, I bet if I look at this, if I hit magnifiers, I'll see all sorts of flaws and base coat that I've put on here already. It's best not to. Well, I'm going to get another shade of um, aluminum paint here. these for that probably do need these for that other because really makes a difference in being able to see the work but um, but no I'm not going to use the, the dark aluminium I think this will show enough contrast and then I'm gonna put this on different places different places on the model so another non painting thing that I was going to do on a stream was a flip but I like you know who usually is the one who asks for a flip and who isn't on asking for a flip so I guess I'll wait for a little while and see if who shows up and if who does show up well then I'll do a flip for who and if not then I will uh, just do the flip anyway because that's part of part of relaxing painting I'm gonna just put out like one drop of this and I'm gonna shake it some more because the what's important here is there's some black pigment in this Essentially, all of these are the same, the same aluminum color. Um, and then they have various amounts of black pigment in them to give them different shades. So this one is, if you can see it, quite a bit darker and the uh, other one. and I'm not going to use a lot of it just you know in a few places like on this the shield this shoulder ridiculous shoulder shield up here it's like why why would you why would you do that why would you have these big shoulder pads on I don't know I mean it's not his shoulders aren't the most flexible thing, so if they were like to deflect missiles and whatever, you'd have to get your shoulder into it. An arm shield would be would be much more effective, like a goalie, like a soccer go uh, hockey goalie, right? They don't put their pads up on their shoulders; they put it on their arms so that they can block. But you know, I guess it's cool looking to have a giant shoulder thing. This shoulder thing on this side is missing because, um, oh wow, like a whole loose piece of plastic in there, debris, you call that, de you know, and the theme of this is taken battle damage, that was battle debris. Paint the a lot of this, these edges, these riveted edges, I'm going to paint a light color. I think I'll do the knee pads in this dark color. And out.
back of its leg there. I think I did anyway. Um, this is this is fairly dark. Um, certainly dark enough to show the contrast between this and the regular aluminum or aluminium. To look at it, step back a little bit and see where else I might want this this color. The shade, anyway. I shouldn't call it another color. It's really a shade. Um, I think I want most of the rest of this. I'm going to paint in um, in intermediate color instead of dark aluminium and the painted dur aluminium which will look there anyway there won't be that much difference um put a little bit down here on the fist Part. I'm getting it on the non fist part. Is that not painted? No. Yeah, this this is part of that, so. I'm just going to try to get it on the fist part. Yeah, I got a blot there. Came right from the side of the brush. That was not good. I'll have to touch that up. Touch up. Um, but maybe I'll put some down in here. Just, just so some contrast, like around the collar here. Underneath the collar. I don't know why. Is this supposed to be like a humanoid inside of a, what, like a Transformer or a Gundam? Is that what they are? Maybe that's what it's supposed to be, but it's so that the you know the arm is weirdly long. Guess it doesn't matter whether there's a humanoid in here or not. The story is going to be the same which is that this is a robotoid kind of thing that has uh, taken battle damage. Yeah. This stuff I should paint the shade onto the bits Back here also. Cut it all over its leg. <clears throat> I, would, I should say that that shouldn't make any difference because I'd be doing battle damage stuff on it anyway. There's this weird skirt like thing that looks like it's part of. Yeah, and so it will be. Um, I'm do the, since I've got this out and there's still some left, I'll do the arm in this shade as well. It'll contrast with the, the lighter color that I'm going to be using for essentially the striping like around these edges.
I'm going to put two more shades on this thing. Two more shades of metallic. One is going to be Dewar Aluminium, which is a shade between these two. And the other is going to be White Aluminium, which is a much lighter color that I'm going to be using for the, like a lot of the, the banding. Okay. Like I said at the beginning of this, it's sort of traditional to make that kind of stuff darker than the base color, but I'm going to make it lighter instead. I need a tiny bit of the plain old-fashioned aluminium, the original color I used, because I have to cover up some spots. That got spotted. Yeah, there. Good enough. And those are the colors I have used. These are the ones I haven't. This brush is working. Okay, I might just keep using this because I'm not doing highly detailed work on this. It's a door aluminium. I'm going to use that on the shield part here, well, the arm, and this whole skirt like thing. There. I think I'm going to use the white aluminium on the helm. When it comes to that. I've been doing a pretty good job of wasting time here. I'm going to let people know now, and I will mention it again later in the stream, that I'm going to be away for almost two weeks. Uh, I'll, be do, I'll be doing Submarine Wednesday on Wednesday. Wednes, Wednesday. Wednes. It's really hard to say it properly. It's W-E-D-N, so it's Wednesday. Wednesday. It's not Wend. People always go E-N. D instead of EDN. I think it's supposed to be like Woden's Day, right? So it should be Woden's Day, but um, it's really hard to say, so everybody says Wednesday. Anyway, yes, I'm going to do Summering when Woden's Day. Um, and then I will be not streaming. I'll be not streaming starting on Friday. So maybe I should say not streaming is ending. I mean, this, this sounds weird to say not streaming is starting, but I'm going to not be streaming Friday and probably most of next week. I might, maybe, maybe I'll try to do some maybe abbreviated streams. Um, but 
I'm dog sitting and I've got two dogs that are sort of well behaved, but I don't like leaving them alone, you know, for a long period of time. I'm told they can be left alone, you know, for hours and it's fine, but I'm looking there. I'm not sure I want to take that chance. Anyway, um, definitely not Friday. Okay. I'll definitely not be streaming Friday and I might very well might not be streaming most of next week, like all of next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's all of next week. Not because of that. So just explaining that now so that people don't, you know, but then I'll be back after that, after the dog sitting is done and has been successful and they are still happy and healthy. And after I'm done sitting with them, um, then I'll be back again on a normal schedule. But for that period of time, for that reason, I will not be doing relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. I'll be taking care of dogs. But I'll be doing uh, Submarine Wednesday this Wednesday and hopefully continuing to make significant progress. It's getting to the point where there's still a lot of work to be done that I will then take a bunch of time to describe so that people who are watching are wondering, why isn't this thing done yet? It looks like it's done. I will explain why it's not done. Wednesday, by going over the parts that aren't yet done and explaining why it's going to take a long time to do them. You know, it sort of sounds like an excuse, but it's not going to be an excuse. It'll just be an explanation because the bits that aren't done, there's like a lot of it are still kind of tedious. You know, they're just things that have to happen that look like they shouldn't take very much time at all, but end up taking more time than those who are just watching think they should. And they probably will take more time than they probably should, but I'm the one doing them and I work pretty slowly. Sometimes there's even an oops and the oops needs to be corrected. So yeah, on Submarine Wednesday, I will be showing the progress that has been made, but also explaining why it's still taking as much time as it's taking to finish it. The parts I'm working on are the machine rooms now, the mechanical rooms. The last, they are the last compartments on the submarine. But yet to be done are the nose and the tail and the dive planes and the propeller. And putting those together isn't going to take very much time. That's not what is going to take time. What's going to take time is finishing them. And what I mean by finishing them, I mean um, filling in the seams, because when parts are cemented together, there's always visible seams. So filling in the seams and sanding them down and then painting the whole thing without um, getting paint on all of the movable parts so that they still move once that's done. So, yeah, I see this. I think, I think the parts that aren't painted yet are the parts that are going to be painted white aluminum. 
I'm just checking now to make sure. There are some parts that are painted that are still going to be painted white aluminum, even though they have paint on them already. So there. Um, but yeah, you can see that, you know, there's three different shades. And depending on how the light hits it, you can see especially the contrast between these two. This this one doesn't contrast quite as much, but it's it's there. Yep. So one more shade of aluminium, the light white white aluminium is what we'll be put on next. And I think I'm going to use my head magnifiers for that. I am fairly sure that I will. And then, after that, I'm going to do the third thing that doesn't involve painting. Well, maybe I'll do the second and third. I'll do the flip and also talk about what comes after what comes after submarine? I know those of you who have been watching for the last two decades as I've been working on the submarine. will find it hard to imagine that in fact there could be an after the submarine that it could be finished. And I'm, I'm retracting my I think it might be done by the end of the first quarter. I think it might be done by July 4th. And I'm retracting that just because of things like missing an entire submarine Wednesday because of dog sitting. And then later on, it turns out that my wife has planned another trip and we just, just can't stay at home, you know? We just can't do it. Has planned yet another trip um, in February, so I'm going to miss at least one more, maybe two submarine Wednesdays. There are some things on the submarine that I, I am not going to be doing on stream, though. Um, like the hull of the submarine needs to be spray painted because it's just a really big area, okay? And the um, I can't do that here on, on camera in the workshop. There There's inadequate ventilation, and I can't get the camera there and anyway. So big chunks of it would not be done. Well, that might speed things along, because if I do them uh, not Wednesday, if I do them, say, like on a Tuesday or Thursday or a weekend or something, then I can show that the work had been done, um, even though it wasn't done on camera. There's, there's that. There's a fair amount of um, prep work that needs to be done on the hull of the submarine, not, and it's not just filling in the seams and sanding it down so that the seams don't show. The um, there's a fair amount of prep work in that the like the outer hull of the submarine, the one that hinges up. Okay, it's on a hinge that is supposed to actually cover the inside of the submarine and then hinge down to show it. There's just a lot of mold problems, not like black mold, but the injection molding didn't work. That need to be filed and sanded and filled and fixed in various ways. And then the whole thing is just spray painted and that should be quick and off camera. But you'll probably see me doing a fair amount of uh, filing and sanding to get it prepared for the spray painting, right? Because 
that's how it's going to go. Anyway, yeah, there's all sorts of little... That's why it ends up taking longer than anybody thinks it probably should, is that the, uh, the injection molding on the kit was poorly done. Painting. But the interior of the submarine is really close to being completed. And you'll see that on Wednesday. You'll see that on Wednesday because I'm working on the last compartments now. It'll be test fitting stuff, uh, painting all sorts of little bits, hard to reach bits, second and third coating. Yeah. like I said second and third coating because the color that I'm using for the floors of the decks just doesn't cover in one coat since it doesn't it needs multiple coats which I shall give it so that kind of Anyway, that's the kind of stuff that will be happening. The upcoming Submarine Wednesday on Wednesday. It is really hard to say it the way it's spelled. Which is probably why no one ever says it the way it's spelled. sections that were not painted I mean there, there's just no paint on them I can't it really is not good I have, I'm gonna have to remember I think that was the dirt aluminium so I mean wow I mean just big chunks of the th of the model that don't have any paint on them at all engine would miss it that badly what happens not wearing paint head magnifiers things didn't get painted that needed to be painted Is there that got painted the wrong color? I'm gonna have to be doing some touching up here. Some some major touches up and some minor touches up. And in this case, it's not even touching up, it's just getting it done the first time at all. Is it just wow? Pretty amazingly badly done. Anyway, that's uh, the upcoming schedule of relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons, basically explaining why it is going to not be relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons off and on in the next bits of the future. because of things I have to do that are not the relaxing painting. And some excuses 
initial excuses for why the submarine continues to take longer than one might have thought. Wow, that got the uh, paint just seeped right into that other spot there. So after break, after this stuff dries a little bit, it's gonna paint this this color because it's painted. After this stuff dries, then I'm gonna do some touching up use my head magnifiers and touch up what needs to be touched. Usually, frequently, when I put my head magnifiers on and I look at the work that had been done previously, it is not a surprise to see some flaws that were not apparent to the naked eye. Okay, That's a fairly common thing to have happen. I'm relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons, but I have to say that this is particularly bad. I mean, really just very bad in terms of missing spots and the need for additional touching up. Usually I don't miss like big chunks, big chunks and sections of something. Well, I mean, just miss it all together in terms of, you know, not getting any paint on it at all. It's not unusual to have little spots of it or to have, you know, the paint kind of go over what one doesn't want it. That's a pretty common thing, but missing it all together, that's, that's an unusual thing. But part of this is going to have to be um, remembering what color I painted things, what shade, so that I can get the appropriate shade on it. Because we have to have, you know, since I'm now going to make this all look like it's all beat up, or at least that's the intent. Ask myself, why is it important that the base coat look good? I can't answer that really well. I mean, so what if a chunk of the model doesn't have any paint on it at all? Just you know, make it look like that was intended by uh, putting some black wash on it or something. I don't think I can let that happen. Okay, um, right here. No, I've got a lot of time yet. I might as well start doing some touching up might as well. Since, um, I've got my head magnifiers on and there's still time left. At least I can do some touching up in the areas where there isn't any wet paint. I can do some touching up like on the back here where I missed, I just completely missed a big chunk, a big spot, totally not painted at all. poorly done. Very badly poorly done.
can't remember what color I painted that. I think I did the, uh, I think I did dark aluminium on that. Some spots on just aluminium. I'm just taking little bits out of the bottle cap here because that's all I really need for the touching that I'm doing. pretty quickly I'm glad I'm just doing this now just getting it getting it done and um, yeah I'm pretty sure the shoulder thing I did for some reason in the uh, dark aluminium happened here since this these paints are really thin they're designed for airbrushing is uh, yeah it just sort of flowed down in there all right these on Turn off the light. Clean the brush. These colors. I'm going to put all these colors over here by the microphone, but you can't see them and they're not in the way. Oh, nice. <laughs> there we go. Fortunately, Fortunately, that is a pretty solid uh, model that um, didn't break and the paint didn't, whatever, it was dry enough so it didn't come off. All right, so there is a base coated, believe it or not, there are four, four different shades of um, aluminum on there. You can see these, that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, the white aluminum banding is not so obvious I was kind of hoping that that would be lighter in color in shade than the rest of it it is but it doesn't show that much but I'm not going to mess with another one I guess I could get chrome which is a supposedly even lighter one I'm not sure but that's base coated all right and what I need to do now is get like gray wash dark gray wash and make like smoke patterns on it uh, do some rust colors I've got a couple of browns basically make this look old and rusty and beat up and I'm going to do that after break because I, I want whatever is on there to dry and now I'm going to do two things that are not painting Who never showed up, but I'll do a flip anyway. Usually I do six flips because who will ask for them, but I'm not here, so here, here's the flipping thing going on. I'll just use this. Not paint. Nope, off camera, on edge. There's a not paint. Two to one not painting, which is fine. All right, the other thing is that um, eventually, uh, the submarine will get done. It's kind of inevitable if I keep working at it that eventually it'll get done. And then we'll come next. I actually do have another submarine. I have a model of the U505. Hmm. I wonder if I should pull that out. 
It was a German submarine that was captured during World War II. It was captured in 1944 and now resides at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And it's pretty cool because they have it indoors and you can walk all around it. It's kind of suspended, um, almost like in a dry dock. In fact, the, if you've seen Das Boot, you know, the German submarine movie Das Boot, um, and they go into a shelter, you know, an underground concrete lined cavern where the submarines are sheltered from bombing attacks, or at least that was the intent. It almost looks like that. It's really, it's really pretty amazing. And you can do tours of the inside and the inside is uh, uncomfortable. You know, it's just, they, they didn't go out of their way to make it a nice place to be. Really, there's, yeah, it's crowded, it's noisy, that kind of thing. Anyway, I do have a U-505 submarine model because the Museum of Science and Industry sells models of the submarine that they have housed there at the museum. So I could, I'll bring that out next, next time after we reject a couple of others. Uh, but I have been going through alternatives and as some alternatives are rejected, I brought out others. So let me show you the survivors of the first tour round. These are the two survivors of the first go around of alternatives. This is the Savoia S21. This is Porco Rosso's plane. It's a 148th scale model. Yep, just keep knocking that over. I'm really glad I didn't do the Quetzalcoatl because by now there would be all sorts of parts missing and scattered all over the floor from knocking it down over like that. So this is Porco Rosso's uh, plane. There's even a Porco Rosso minifig in there. Okay, so that's one that I could do. That one has received um, several yes votes the other is a large scale a very large scale 1957 corp convertible large large enough that i can't get it all on at once right and it supposedly has headlights and taillights that light up with these tiny little hair diameter wires <laughs> it says carpeted interior the carpeting is actually pretty funny it's uh adhesive backed felt on a piece of paper it's got lots of chrome details the pieces are not as good as that anyway this would be not it says it's skill level two let me show it to you just so you know i'm not lying skill level two no this one would be like skill level four if you know just in terms of getting the chrome right without getting cement on it and bubbling the chrome uh, the windshield, that kind of thing. And then painting it, even though it's molded in red, you know, and there's like a white decal to put in, that really needs to be painted glossy red paint. So that would take, um, you know, a lot of skill to get it all spray painted and then attach the chrome bits without messing up the chrome or the paint. So, but that's still in the running. It's a pretty cool model. I actually started building one of these way back in 1970s the model i think dates to that time and yeah didn't go that well it's kind of a mess this is interesting this is a model of the uss enterprise command bridge the original enterprise it's i haven't opened this it's still in its shrink wrap it's probably collectible i should look on ebay to see if i could get like a lot of money for it or not but it's it's in the running uh, this was made, you, you can even tell by the picture, even though this is not a picture of the model itself, you can just imagine that on the inside there are some really poorly formed models of Sulu and Kirk and Spock. And if you look at the control panels, I imagine that there are stickers, that they're not decals, but they're stickers to uh, put on the control panels to make it look like it's got all these little things on it. 
So this this might be kind of fun. I I think if you just look at the picture, which is usually like way more detailed than the actual model is supposed to make it look good, it looks so weird and badly done that I I'm guessing it's like there's black plastic and red plastic and uh, stickers and like mold marks and junk all over the place. Even the chair it just has sharp corners all over it. So I'm guessing that unless Oh, it's the 25th anniversary on there. 1991. Oh my God. It's that old. <laughs> what? That was 30 years. The 25th anniversary was 33 years ago. That's really scary. Anyway, this model dates back to the 25th anniversary of Star Trek. I date back to the original series. I mean, I was in grade school when that came out. And uh, yeah, so there. But this is in the running. That's a possibility. And then I've got uh, two others. These were already introduced. I introduced the the Star Trek uh, command bridge on when was it Friday? No, maybe Wednesday. Anyway, the ones that have been rejected so far was a, were was a gigantic Deep Space Nine model that's also in its original shrink wrap and decided not to tackle that because it wouldn't even fit on, I mean, the submarine hardly fits, but this thing wouldn't even fit on what I've got as a work surface here. And it, it probably is also worth like three times more than I paid for it. So it's now a collectible, maybe, I don't, I don't know for sure. But anyway, um, it was impractical. When the other one that was rejected was the Lamborghini Aventador Super Veloce, uh, just the, the Corvette beat it out. So two have been rejected so far. We need to reject some more. Uh, the Star Trek command bridge is a cool one. So I went to my massive model collection and found a couple others that were kind of interesting. This one is a really tiny scale. It's like 144th scale or something. Yeah, 1 144th scale. It is a model of a plane that supposedly doesn't really exist. Okay. It's the uh, Lockheed SR-91 Aurora, which there, there was a project called the... We don't know, you know? There were, there were triangular lights over Area 51 and massive sonic booms, and so there was a speculation that this was a plane to replace the SR-71 Blackbird, um, the Aurora Project. There was even a television commercial about a car called the Aurora. And it was like our Aurora, not the Air Force Aurora. So, I don't know, it was like 20 years ago or something. This was a to do, a big to do about whether this plane even existed or not. But whether the plane existed or not, there is a model of it. Let me see. Let's open it up, see what's in here. Supposedly the model is like this long. I don't know how that could be because the box isn't even out. Yeah, this is this is actually cool. It's molded in white, so it definitely has to be painted. Um, so anyway, this is kind of intriguing, you know, just as a thing, as a thing to do. Oh, it even comes with. Uh, like other models that of planes that don't exist. But yeah, this is it. They've got like ramjets, I guess, on the bottom. Turbo compressors, landing gear. It's not a very well anyway, it's not a very well done model. There's hardly any pieces to it, but it's you know, it's kind of cool to have a model of a plane that doesn't exist. And then it comes with um, you know, bonus model, the F-19A stealth fighter there. I don't know if that exists either. I don't think so. Anyway, it's kind of, you know, kind of fun to have this. Um, and that's an option to build a model of a plane that supposedly never existed along with a couple of others. So if you have a preference for that, let me know. And the other one, I'm probably not going to build this, but I just want to show you that 
Um, because it is. I built one of these also when I was in grade school. This was the uh, Lotus Ford that won the Indianapolis 500. Jim Clark drove this. The uh, rear engine car, it was the second year a rear engine car drove at Indianapolis. They didn't win the first year. Okay, I think they just broke down maybe, but uh, the second year, this model, the, the, the real version of this actually won. And this is just like the kit. This isn't a reproduction. This goes back to the 60s. Okay. This is just like the, um, the, the one that I built back then. And we're supposed to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all sorts of colors. Not counting the green. Okay. It's molded in green and there's a decal that goes across the top, the stripe. Um, Anyway, it's a pretty cool model. When I built it, I didn't paint it. I just glued it together and, you know, put the decals on. Uh, it's still in its shrink wrap. The, uh, it, it comes with, um, special decals okay go on the side of it so this is this is not the original decals those are inside the box but like special decals to show all of the sponsors and stuff okay, this is 65 Lotus Ford so I think this model came out shortly thereafter the other thing is that um, you know this date that doesn't it shows you how long ago I did this the real one, the real Lotus Ford, is at the uh, Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. And so I have taken pictures of the, the real Lotus Ford. These are Polaroids, back when Polaroids still worked. So I got to see like the interior detail uh, and some of the suspension work. And uh, you can see the sponsored decals and stuff. Those are real decals. So using a decal to represent the decals actually makes sense. Uh, there are, there's some significant differences between the original and the model. Yeah, one of the biggest ones, so you can see it here, is that the exhaust is chromed on the model, but the original one, it's not as painted flat yellow. Definitely not chromed exhaust. So, uh, if I were to build this model, okay, I would um, definitely paint it original. The other is you can see the interior. It's green with a yellow stripe on the seat. Uh, that is not the case. As you can see in these not so terribly good pictures, it's actually kind of a brownish leather color. Okay, with kind of green around the outside. So the model is, does not have fidelity to the original in all ways. The, the big 82 circle and the yellow stripe and the green color, yeah. And the chrome suspension, but not the exhaust or the interior. So if I were to build this, I would use these, use these photos, which I had off screen as I was pointing things out, like the interior is not green, okay? Um, and I would use these as a guide if I were to make this model. So, um, so far I've got the 57 Corvette convertible, the Savoia S21, the Porco Rosso plane, the Star Trek command bridge, and then introducing just as options because I, you know, they were just sitting here. Why not show them the non existent SR91 Aurora, or maybe it does exist? and the, the 65, 1965 Indianapolis 500 winning Lotus Ford. So there, thanks. If you have any input on that, you know, I'm going to reject two of these um, in the next 
next go around and maybe pick out one or two other models. I mean, I might pull out the U505 submarine because of Submarine Wednesday just to have another submarine, but you know, I don't think that would be a very interesting model to make. You know, there's a more Star Trek stuff. I've got a Klingon uh, Bird of Prey. Yeah, a Klingon Bird of Prey. That might be cool. That might be fun. To build. And uh, yeah, just just a bunch of other stuff. There's a Hindenburg model. That would not be interesting. It's just like two halves with a gondola and a couple of propellers that pretty much has to be spray painted. Uh, like white aluminum, probably. That wouldn't be much fun. There's a lot of World War II airplanes. Including Horton. Horton flying wing. Yeah. Gigantic V2 rocket. No. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm going to start narrowing this down. I have my own favorite. If I don't get too terribly much feedback from other people, I'm just going to pick that one. But there's still an opportunity to influence the decision. I'm going to take a break, and after break, I'm going to come back and start making this look beat up. Okay? Like with rust and smoke damage and stuff like that using various and sundry washes and we'll see how it turns out and then i'll paint the base something and if that gets done before two o'clock or much before two o'clock which it could be i might start working on this weird little eight-legged spiky thing i'm not sure what that is, what this is but during break i'll ask and find out what it is and what the appropriate colors would be. And then I'll talk a little bit more about how I'm not going to be doing relaxing painting next week. Just to remind people, uh, see so that you don't think that for some reason I'm just stopping. Anyway, um, as usual, I do need a break. And so I'm going to take one. I should be back, oh, like around 1230-ish or so, Eastern Standard Time. Hello, I will, there it is, try and find this cursor of the mouse so I could turn the other camera back on the thing here. Okay, um, ended break a little bit early because I started a little bit early, but uh, yeah, now I've got my post break. It's really chilly down here because it's zero degrees outside, uh, vest on. And what I'm going to do is try to make this look battle damaged and rusty and beat up and who knows how it'll turn out. We'll see. And then if there's time left, if I'll either end early or start working on this, which turns out to be a basilisk, which is supposed to be painted various shades of blue with kind of white highlights and red spikes. And I happen to have blues and reds and whites, so I should be able to do that. Um, theoretically, at least anyway. So, um, yeah, what, what's to be done about this? Let's find out. I will take some dark gray wash. Do a good shaking. It's supposed to be a little ball bearing in there. I guess I can hear it. That means that the pigment has settled quite badly. And what I'm going to do with this is make smudges, like smoke smudges, kind of, you know, on various and sundry places of the model. Sometimes it um, splashes. I don't need much. Just take a little bit. Mainly kind of dry brush it at first. I 
Here's a spot for it. That's a good spot for a smudge. It's a, I think that's a technical term. Smudging. But one is symmetric. Smudges shouldn't be symmetric. It should just be kind of blotted around. a fair amount of smudging on this. random random darkening uh, stuff because it went into battle while shiny right and now it's now it's not shiny anymore it's got like places where it's all yeah darkened You can always make it darker in spots if I want to. Who knows if I want to or not, and find out. Um, there. I mean, that's just there's some starts of smudges, and now I think I'm going to um, sure if rust is the right thing. I want to make it look like there's like oil leaks or something on it, right? This should be a good color. This is kind of a reddish brownish color. I think it might work better as a looking like rust than uh, than just a brown. Hmm. But there's definitely a lot of leakage from here. It's where, you know, an arm got blown off, so if there's lubricants leaking, that should be the, that should be the place. And then, like, if there's damage here, there should be leaking from the joint. A lot of flow of whatever is in there coming down there that should be that's kind of that's good and get some on this side it's like a little bit under the shoulder here maybe maybe a little bit up on the front Gatters some. Interesting on the 
silvery color. <laughs> I don't know if the back will ever show, but I, why not? I'll put some stuff on the back here, too. You could make it look like it pooped its pants, right? here on the helm. Yeah. Too much, but you know, enough to make it look kind of interesting. Yeah, this brown is working better than the black did in terms of <laughs> making it look like interesting and kind of beat up. <laughs> I'm going to do too much on it, but you know. Pretty close to being done with this. Probably more around the back, maybe. You can move. Need just some light messing up. Yeah, especially where it got blown up here. I might be pretty much done with this, you know? It just, just sort of came along okay. just keep making it dark just for the sake of doing it but there it looks um it looks kind of battle worn maybe i'll put some down around the bottoms of the feet here and i'll paint the base i'm just going to paint the base gray um maybe even black i think i'm just going to paint it black Well, I think I'm going to do a little base coating on the basilisk and pick some blues out and then maybe end a little early today. I've got some, I have to go out in the snow again to fix a thing I messed up yesterday. And then probably, you know, check the bird feeders. But that... Pretty much. This is pretty much what we wanted. So there. I'll just leave it at that. And then just do like like a heavier brush. I think I'll use this. And I'm, I'm probably going to be using this this uh, same black that I use for the inside of the helm. 
with painted black. And there's a lot of surface area on here, so this might take a little while to do. And use this flat black color. And maybe even put a little wash on it later to just, you know. Maybe not. This doesn't need to be interesting. This this is not going to be used for anything anyway. <clears throat> it was just a kind of a misprint. So it was, well, you know, you have to paint something on relaxing painting, so why don't you paint something relaxing? Like something that had has no real consequences in terms of, you know, needing to be done for the D and D stream. The D and D show, or something like that. So, yeah, it served its purpose, which was to um, give me something to paint for a couple of hours. Actually, I hardly painted that long at all because I spent most of my time talking about things that weren't painting. Okay, I didn't. I did what? Like 45 minutes, maybe an hour's worth of painting on the stream so far at all. It might even, it might be like that. <coughs> Not getting your money's worth today in terms of painting. Not, oh, speaking of money. Yeah. And support for Dyson Dungeons. Dyson Dungeons is primarily a, you know, a Dungeons and Dragons uh, show that psh, comes on Twitch with a live chat. Usually three Sundays a month, but you know, with the holidays and everything, um, sometimes there's been some breaks, but you should if you can't catch it with the live chat on Twitch, you can catch those on YouTube or even as a podcast. They work as a podcast, it's surprisingly. Surprisingly. But that's because we're so entertaining and lively during our show. At any rate, if you'd like to uh, support Dyson Dungeons, please become a follower on Twitch. Or if you get on YouTube, you can become a sponsor. Okay? And, um, yeah, and if you really like us, you can go to patreon.com slash dice and dungeons and become a patron and patrons get access to the DM notes, which are, you know, pretty interesting. And also to our warm up improv sessions, which are always hilarious. I have to, I have to say they are pretty funny because that's how we warm up. before each show and just putting a little more smudging on a little more smudginess hither and yon eat up and battle can't can't be not smudged There, you can do that. I think this is what they were going for. You know, make it look 
used up anyway there. Um, so this being completed, I need to then find some base coat colors with basilisk. And I saw some pictures of it. And it's mainly blue. Okay. With red spikes. And then there's uh, white, like dry brushing highlights and stuff on it. A little lighter underneath than on the top. So I need to find a, a nice blue color that would look decent on it. I don't want to use like aquamarine is a aquamarine is a really pretty color. This light blue might be good for like underneath. This light sea gray is not too bad. There's some decent medium. I haven't used medium blue in a long time. I'd be okay, but I think it was more bluey than that. More like well, uh, like this flat blue. I think I'm going to use the flat blue as the base coat and then work from that in terms of the spikes and the colors, over colors. Okay. Because I can always pull out things like the medium blue or the light sea gray and like do it underneath or around the back or something. But um, these are really pretty colors, but they're not going to work. But I think flat blue is as the starting point and then just layer stuff on it would work okay uh, the spikes probably will end up being scarlet red which is our go-to red color for stuff as i look at the chart of reds that are available here color chart has fallen apart Yeah, I mean, the dark vermilion always turns out to be too orange, the regular flat red. That, that might be okay. But... All of the colors are out and about. That one probably isn't. There's probably one that isn't. Although I thought I used it yeah, maybe I didn't use it on the rainbow. <laughs> Is that like the one color? No, one of the very few colors that I haven't pulled out of the stand here. Look where it would be. Yeah, it was, believe it or not. There's hardly any left in there. Hi, old Roger. Um, what I was doing today is um well i finished i finished this before the rainbow unicorn which supposedly is going to get glittered we don't have any glitter so they're looking into water-based glitter nail polishes i have no idea why this exists and then i decided not to do the quetzalcoatl because it was a good idea because if I put it on the stand, I knocked this over like three times already. So I did something sturdier. And there was just this misprint robot. It came off of the 3D printer without an arm. So now it just looks like a rusty, beat up. Um, yeah, it's just rusty and beat up. And I think I think I did an okay job of, of shading it. You know, with, if I put on my head magnifiers, it would look crappy, but... Um, as it is, it looks, it turned out okay. Uh, but what I have for your feedback, okay, for your feedback is some additional model alternatives for post-submarine. I've got the Corvette, the Stingray, the, not the Stingray, the 57 Corvette convertible, and the Porco Rosso plane, biplane. I've got those still in the running. I put the Deep Space Nine away, but kept out the Star Trek Enterprise command bridge because it's just, it's so weird that I just like to show the model. But I do need to uh, look it up on eBay to see. I can't, can't I read anything anymore. 
216 colors. Holy cow. Um, I'm not going to do that, okay? I've got these many colors there, plus a few more. And I, wow, I'm going to have to look at it, though. It's like Crayola 64. You know, when I was a kid, that was the big deal, is to get the 64 colors. And who could imagine that there were that many different crayon colors, but 216 different, but different shades probably. But you're, you're a really good modeler, so I'm sure that that would be worthwhile. Anyway, the Star Trek, uh, yeah, congratulations on that. The Star Trek command bridge is still in the running because if I were to open this, um, I'm sure I would find that the parts were very badly molded in red and black and blue and that there were stickers for the control panels. But I pulled out a couple of other things. This one I probably won't build, but I wanted to show it. This I built. This is another one I built when I was a kid. This is the 1965 Indy uh, winner, the, the Lotus Ford that established rear engines. Six colors in each color. Wow. I am going to have to look that up, though, to see how they do it. Um, so this model I built when I was a kid, and I didn't paint it at all. I just put the decals on and... You know, it was a pretty cool model, but we live in Michigan and can go to the Henry Ford Museum where the actual car is. I took these pictures ages ago because I had a Polaroid camera that was still working. Um, but it shows the, uh, the real colors of the interior and the exhaust. Yeah, the, the, the Deep Space Nine, well, I mean, but it's so big. I mean, if I did finish it, I have no idea where it would go. And it, it, with all the little spikes and prongs and everything, it would be covered in dust and be worthless. I mean, never be able to be cleaned. So anyway, yeah, so this car, I took pictures of this. So if I ever built the model, I could get the colors right because the model itself isn't right especially the exhaust which you can see on the original car is paint is yellow not chromed and the interior is not green with a yellow stripe it's uh brown leather so i'm not sure i would build this one but it's in the running if if feedback says yeah that could be something that would be fun the other one the other one definitely is in the running This is a weird little model that I discovered on eBay. It is a Lockheed SR-91 Aurora. So I don't know if you remember, but back, I don't know, must have been like 20 years ago, there were rumors that a new spy plane was being tested in Area 51. It was triangular in shape because the lights were triangles flying over and there were sonic booms. So supposedly this is even like more hypersonic than the Blackbird than the SR-71 and there were claims that it actually did exist so for some reason isn't it weird yeah so for, for some reason whoever whoever made this um, sci-fi dynamics right decided that this is what the SR-91 Aurora would be I think it was like Chrysler or something made a car called the Aurora and they even had a commercial which was kind of funny they said oh you know and they had uh, this streak in the sky with a sonic boom saying oh no not the Air Force Aurora our Aurora it's a really kind of crappy model okay it just comes like this but it's uh, Anyway, yeah, and it comes with two bonus models of other planes that don't exist, which makes it even better. So this might be not very challenging to make. Um, it would just have to be cemented together and then, oh yeah, you, you actually look it up. And I'm sure the internet has a whole thing about it, about the Aurora program and the rumors that surrounded it. But it was supposed to be like a mock five or six plane or something so that you know the instructions make it look like this 
as you can see, there aren't, aren't very many pieces. They would just need to be uh, cemented together and the seams done. And then there's other these other things like the F-19, which doesn't exist, Stealth Fighter, and this other, anyway, the, the sci-fi model. The sci-fi dynamics from Kowloon City in Hong Kong decided to make it. Yeah, the whole rumor about it was really pretty interesting. And, you know, we still don't know whether it ever really existed or not. But if it did, there it is. So anyway, that's another kit that I could potentially put together. And, you know, I'm going to get rid of a couple of these, depending on feedback I'm getting. And um, I was just looking over to my other model kits, and I actually do have another submarine, the U-505, which was the submarine captured in World War II, a German submarine that's now in Chicago at the museum there. Uh, so if we wanted to continue Submarine Wednesday, I could bring out a submarine. I don't think it would be a very interesting model, but, you know, it would keep that going. So anyway, this guy's done. I don't want to mess with it anymore, and I'm now going to be working on this basilisk, which apparently is mainly blue with some shading to lighter blues underneath and some white um, highlighting and red spikes on top. And I'm going to paint everything blue. Yes, that is it's where they got. They did get the Enigma machine. In fact, the Enigma machine that they got out of the submarine is at the museum in where a in Enigma machine. I think it's the one that was in the submarine. Is that uh, is at the museum as well? Anyway, there is an Enigma there. But yeah, it was in June of '44. I think it was actually on my birthday, June 4th. I think it's when they captured it, but. I'm not that old. I'm a little bit younger than 1944. Um, but yeah, they captured the submarine and uh, brought it back to the U.S. and they got an Enigma machine out of it, which was pretty cool. The um, It was one of those violation of the Geneva Convention kind of situations too, though, because we didn't want the Germans to know that we captured one of their machines and got their Enigma because then they would use a different coding system. So the Geneva Convention requires that the government and the families be notified if someone is captured and not killed, and we didn't. So we kept we kept it a secret that um, that the submarine had been captured and that the crew, all but one of the crew, was saved. But it wasn't until after the end of the war that the families knew that. They were informed by the Germans that the submarine was way overdue and was presumed lost in all hands. Anyway, yeah. So it's over there, and I, after I get rid of a couple of these um, to keep narrowing it down, um... I'll probably get rid of the Lotus Ford. I'm not sure I really want to build that. It's a cool kit, though. And eventually I might. Um, I'm going to have to look up the Star Trek bridge to see if it's worthwhile. I might keep the SR-91 just as, uh, you know, as a thing to talk about. But I might pull out the U-505 just to, you know... No. It's just a submarine. Oh, did you go to the Air and Space Museum? Yeah, the SR-71 up close is really amazing. Um, an even more amazing place, believe it or not, is the Museum of the Air Force in Dayton at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So those of you who are conspiracy theorists will know that Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is where they keep the alien bodies from uh, the Roswell incident. Those of you who aren't conspiracy buffs will believe that there are no alien bodies there, but the Museum of the Air Force has an Air SR-71. They have an X-15. I got to touch the X-15. You could walk right up to it. They had a, a stairwell, so you could look into the cockpit, which was <laughs> incredibly primitive. It was I mean, you just looked at it. The seat was barely padded. The instruments were difficult to read. Um, 
but that was amazing. And they have a B-70, the one remaining B-70 Valkyrie there as well. And that's the Mach 3 bomber prototype that they had built. And that, that had problems with paint because um, when it flew at speed, the paint melted off. But that was cool. But yeah, there's really just amazing things. The other thing they have, this was that filled the entire hangar. Mm -hmm. You need to see the Smithsonian, you need to go to the Smithsonian uh, Udvar Hazy uh, Museum. They have a Concorde and a space shuttle. That would be, uh, the, I mean, that would be, pre it is pretty cool to see. And they have a, a Horton, the only remaining Horton flying wing. I think that might be on display soon. It was being renovated, not renovated, but restored like seven or eight years ago when I was there. And um, just some other one of a kind planes. It's a long way from town. You know, you got to spend like $120 for a taxi ride to get there from the Air and Space Museum in, in Washington, but that's worth it. But the, uh, the Museum of the Air Force in Dayton is, has has a B-36 peacemaker, they called it. <laughs> that was kind of a funny name because its job was to drop hydrogen bombs, right? That was the sole reason it was created. And the hydrogen bombs back then were about the size of, um, of an Airstream trailer. <laughs> and that's why the bomber was so big because, you know, the bombs were not miniaturized. But they have one of those and it's just... It's fascinating to see one um, and walk underneath it. I think, if I remember correctly, that used the same engines that were used later on the Lockheed Constellation. The largest piston engine, uh, airplane engines ever made. Incredibly complicated. There were like four rows of cylinders that all had to be timed so that it they didn't fight against each other. And apparently, um, it, it had this not only complicated startup sequence, but a whole very complicated shutdown sequence that even if it were followed perfectly, sometimes the engine wouldn't start again. That's another thing. I think I talked about that, um, is that the the very complicated piston engines that the Continental, the, the, the Lockheed Connie, wherever it flew, the air, the airport uh, maintenances had to have extra engines, spare engines, in case there was an engine failure or it shut down and didn't start again. But uh, yeah, they have like one of everything at the Museum of the Air Force. Some like one, like. The, S, the B-70, where there is only one of a thing. Um, they, they also have weird stuff, like they have the, the Air Force One that carried Kennedy's body back from his assassination. Um, you know, they make a deal about that, which is kind of creepy, actually. Uh, and I think they have Eisenhower's Air Force One. Well, this is definitely blue, so it's going to need a lot of shading and highlighting and stuff so that it doesn't look just like blue. Um, I'm using a larger brush because of larger surfaces, but you know, it's not a very good brush because I need to get it in between all of these little spikes. Yeah, there's two, there's, there's multiple hangars there's a oh yeah an f-22 raptor you're supposed to not touch any of these planes you know don't touch but it's sort of when you're next to an x-15 and you're looking into the cockpit of it it's kind of hard not to just touch the surface there was a docent there and I should have asked, I, I mean, I'm sure he would have said no. He definitely should have said no, but it was really tempting to say, can I get in? There was hardly anybody else in the museum. 
no one would have noticed getting into that. That would have been an amazing experience, but you no. Know, Yes, yeah, like in Dayton, Ohio, there's nothing around it other than Dayton. Uh, I could have disparaged Dayton at all. But it's, you know, it's, the, it's just a big Air Force base. It's an active Air Force base. And then they built these gigantic hangars so that they could hold multiple planes. There's a, you know, a real B-52, a whole B-52 in there that had service in Vietnam. Its skin is all wrinkled from, you know, just the aluminum skin is all wrinkly. Some other classic planes, you know, if you're into like Cold War fighter planes, the F-104 Starfighter, which was basically just a jet engine some fuel tanks and not very much of that in a cockpit that's all it was it was just the most powerful uh, jet engine that they had at the time and they built this tiny little airframe around it with little bitty stubby wings but the the leading edge of the wing this is this is kind of an unusual weird thing but it's true the leading edge of the wing Hi, welcome to First Time Chat. I'm here babbling about uh, airplanes on display at various museums, like the Air and Space Museum, and Udvar Hazy thing for the Smithsonian, and the Museum of the Air Force in Daytona. Because I really used to, I was really into these airplanes when I was like in grade school and high school, but so the F-104, it has these stubby little wings. I think it landed in, at like 200 and some miles an hour. It had to, it was, it also had a history of crashing because um, it was very unstable. But the leading edge of the wing is so sharp that when it's on the ground, they put felt covers around it. Oh, two days. I mean, you really can if you want to take the time to examine the planes. And they have so many, um, like, static displays, too, of, of different artifacts. There's a section, there's like three hangars, maybe four hangars, actually. There's one that goes into, like, the early history of flight and... Has, you know, spads and biplanes and triplanes in it. I have to tell the this is this is really kind of a funny thing. So there's um, <clears throat> why am I talking about airplanes on relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons instead of Dungeons and Dragons? Well, because <clears throat> on the stream it's I ramble on about stuff. So at the Museum of the Air Force, in the section of biplanes, they have two bombers there, because there were bombers in World. One was a U.S. one that was done, I think, right at the end of the war. I'm not sure it ever saw active surface in the uh, service. And the other one was Italian. And so just to describe them roughly. You know, they were almost the same size and the same shape, being biplanes and all. But the Italian one had, out in the front was the bombardier, okay, in the front of the plane in an open area. Thank you for the follow. And um, the Italian one was a wicker basket. And it, the plane itself actually had a heart painted on it. it was, this is a bomber in a warplane, you know, but it had this wicker basket and it's painted in kind of bright colors and things like that. And the U.S. one was painted olive drab and the thing out in front was made out of metal. It was just this like big hanging thing. It was just like, no, oh, the Italians, yeah, they had this 
they just made their plane look all like cute and just that but it was done in good taste it was fashionable the u.s one was just olive drab and you know soulless almost anyway just every plane that was made that the air force flew is at the museum of the air force unfortunately you know no alien bodies we didn't get to see the alien bodies there so you have to start doubting their existence really but if there are oh have dinner thanks for dropping in ollie and uh yeah i'm going to be doing submarine wednesday but i will be going dark uh, while i'm dog sitting probably friday and most of next week but i'll say more about that on wednesday but do drop in on Wednesday because uh, submarine is coming along. It's good, been good progress. So yeah, I'm trying to make sure this whole thing is blue as much as I can, at least the areas that I can reach and see. And then um, I'm going to paint the inside of the mouth. Uh, yeah, maybe I don't know. Start doing some shading and highlighting sorts of spikes what would be really nice is if I could say oh it's blue it's done but I can't I think the blue is okay it's it's um it's a good base color you can make things lighter and darker based on that pretty well <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry always post break I it gets it just feels like it keeps getting colder and colder colder down here <clears throat> in the basement of the house where I have my not studio but work surface um Scarlet red is kind of the standard color for the mouths, but I'm going to I'm going to use the really dark black red for the inside of the mouth. I'm going to put my head magnifiers on so I can see what I can I'm doing. I'll probably see flaws in the base coat of the blue, and if I do, the paint is still alive, and <clears throat> I will touch those up as I see them because I almost certainly will have them there. I am going to go, you know, do a quick ad for D&D &D Dice and Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons show, and show off our dungeon tiles, but I'm probably going to end early today because I've got some things that I need to do outside, and the outside has 18 inches of snow on it. <laughs> And I really, I just want to get it over with and then come in and put on some new socks that are dry and try to warm up after that. Also, I should eat something because I'm told when, when I have my break, I should eat during break and I didn't. I got distracted and did something else. Anyway, this is a very dark red. I think this will work well on the basilisk mouth. And uh, it might be just as, just as well that I stop at this point. Because before I start doing things like painting the teeth, you know, or sh doing some shading and dry brushing and things, the paint, the paint might be better if it's dry. You know, I'm seeing spots that I missed, so after I paint the inside of the mouth, I'm going to you know, do touch up on the blue, since I have these head magnifiers on. Jump the blue. <clears throat> And then uh, do some ads for our show. The advocacy, if not ads, I should call them. Well, that's an ad, isn't it? Advocacy is an ad. 
that works. I'll take it. I get blue and red paint all over the teeth, but that's okay because they'll get painted white or ivory, probably, or maybe some other off color. I won't say anything off color, but I'm going to paint off color. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I've been to bristle on this brush, I like this brush. See if I can make it come back and I clean it. Get a bristle that's at a 90 degree angle to the rest of the brush, guaranteeing that paint will go where one doesn't want it. Okay, let me see if I clean this, if the bristle will come back and join the rest of it. It's, looks like it might. <clears throat> if not, I'll have to remove the bristle. And it looks like it looks like it came back to form a point, which is good. Um So yeah, I'm just I'm gonna go around now and see the spots, like there's one here that uh, didn't get base coated. There's some, mm, surprisingly, around the spikes. It's not too bad. I am actually quite surprised. Usually there's, there is some sort of little filament there that needs to be taken off. Usually there's a lot of a lot of spots that didn't get covered. And there aren't that many. To invite again everybody and anybody who's watching this, either during the stream now or on YouTube, which would be later than now, to um, check out our Dungeons & Dragons show. That's what Dyson Dungeons is all about, is the Dungeons & Dragons show, which <laughs> streams with a live chat three Sundays a month on Twitch. And if you don't catch it then, uh, get past episodes on YouTube or as a podcast. And the show is really cool. Very good. We do it. It is a show. It's not just a watching us play a basement game. It's it's a real show, and so we attempt to make it as entertaining and fun as possible. I hope we succeed. The um, relaxing painting was a spin-off. that show because dungeon tiles and minifigs like this one we might actually run into a basilisk sometime i wouldn't be terribly surprised um get printed in our on our printers and painted and the decision was made well I'm going to be painting anyway might as well stream it because everything gets streamed nowadays is does this sort of thing so um yeah this basilisk probably will show up on our show sometime it's the kind of thing that we would run into for some reason our dungeon master thinks it's kind of fun to try to kill us almost killed me once twice actually more than once being almost killed isn't that much fun the character being almost killed. 
a lot of fun for everybody else, including including the other members of the party. Yeah, well, yeah, it's great fun, but it would be good if you check that out. It's a big tooth there. Um, so I'm going to let this dry, and then the next time I work on it, Basculus, which might be more than a week from now, because I'm going to be taking some time off starting Friday to do dog watching. I've been told, well, you can go ahead and leave the dogs alone. They'll be okay. You can do a stream. I'm not sure I trust that. I might, you know, keep an eye out. I might do some shortened streams, probably not Friday. Okay, but maybe next week I'll try to pop in for like an hour or so and do an abbreviated uh, stream of relaxing painting with dice and dungeons. I can't promise. It depends on how the dogs are behaving and how <clears throat> how certain I am that they will be okay if left alone. But I'll continue to work then on the basilisk. I have to paint the spikes different shades of red and do shading, undershading, and some white highlighting and stuff to make it look not just blue. But I'm going to show you dungeon tiles because these are really amazing. I, mean, I like to do this every stream if I can. Why not? Um, we do. They make we, we make some that look like stone. We make some that look like sewers. We make some that look like cut stone. We make all sorts of little accessories like tents and sleeping bags and lanterns and stuff. These are the ones I like the best. These represent wood. You can tell because it looks wooden with all sorts of like wood grain and stuff on it. Um, so these are printed on the 3D printers that I have that are behind me. Solid piece here so that they're very sturdy and stay at 90 degree angles and don't come apart. Um, primed, base coated, washed to bring out the color, highlighted to bring out the stucco. Okay. But the main feature is that under this plate are ball magnets in the corners, and so they adhere to each other, regardless of the orientation that you might set them in, so that the dungeon tiles can be reconfigured quickly and easily to represent a warehouse, or a den of thieves, or a castle, a castle uh, banquet room, or a tavern. And so besides those features, uh, there are also floor tiles and rounded corners and things like that. We have operating doors. The doors work. They're hinged. So that when we enter into, say, a warehouse where something might be lurking and we decide to go through the door, we go, our minifigs go, dum, 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 dum. they make that sound, by the way, dum, 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 dum. Um, and then open the door and hide behind it. And hopefully something will rush out and we'll be able to ambush it non-lethally um, so that it doesn't interfere with the rest of our mission. Or we'll open it this way and come in from that direction and they'll be hiding here and ambush us as we come out. Probably that because for the DM that's a lot more fun to have us be ambushed as we walk through the door, not having checked for traps or listened to see if there's anything on the other side. Why would we do that? Anyway, yeah. Um, that's how Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons started because these things all needed to be painted and they got painted in streams. And now I'm doing mini figs that are done on the rosin printer across the hall. And on Wednesdays, I am working on a Dunwall Cutaway submarine, which will be finished sometime during 2024. At the beginning of the year, I said it would probably be done during the first quarter of the year. Now, as we are two weeks into that, and I'm looking at the schedule of travel, whatever, and having to miss a couple of, like at least one episode <clears throat> um, because of dog sitting, I'm saying July 4th, not promising, just targeting that. Anyway, I am going to end a little bit early because I am cold and hungry. 
I want to thank everybody for joining in. Thank you for the new follow. I really appreciate it. Tell all of your friends and relatives, people who are not your friends and not your relatives, people who are acquaintances, people you don't even know, that they should check out the Dungeons & Dragons show presented by Dice & Dungeons. Check it out on YouTube. That's a good, easy way to catch up on things. And uh, join in on Relaxing Painting with Dyson Dungeons, where I will go around and talk for an hour and a half about the stuff that's at the Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, because airplanes, why not? <clears throat> or maybe Mr. Ed, like I did before. Or maybe Yogi Bear. Or maybe um, whether or not there were way too many Westerns on in the 50s and 60s, and what their theme songs might be. You never know what might fill the time on relaxing painting with Dyson Dungeons. And if nothing else, you can always listen to the really cool music. Um, so thanks again. And I will be back on Wednesday at about 10 o'clock and we'll work on the submarine. There is enough to do on the submarine that I will almost certainly fill the time all the way up until two because it's just, it's just getting to the point where everything that needs to be done just needs to be done so that I can eventually reach some sort of conclusion that will involve painting, it will involve sanding, it will involve filing, it will involve dithering about whether to paint or scrape paint on the exposed edges of the submarine, which won't make any sense until you see it on Wednesday, but will make a lot of sense then. Um, oh yeah, so I did something today. I got a beat up, rusting, oil leaking, battle scarred metal thing and a base coated basilisk and a reconstituted reattached arrowhead on the arrow of the archer sprite thing so stuff got accomplished today that's pretty good that doesn't always happen anyway yes enough babbling I am actually quite cold and hungry and I have a really unpleasant task to do outside in the 18 inches of snow and I'd best get on with it. So I'll see you again on Wednesday. Thanks so much. Take care. <laughs>